Welcome to the Situation Room. Thank you very much. It's good yeah. to have you here again. Well, I'm, I'm in a real situation here with Ndu, mm. okay, because <laughs> I always, you know, since we met last, I always have been singing a song. I'd, it was... Um, it was very, very popular when, when I was a young man, okay? How do you do what you do to me? If only I knew. Mm. And um, I don't know if you uh, rhym rhyme with that, you know, but do yes. and do is mm. very close together. You see? This How is true. How do you do what mm. you do to me do. if I only knew? <laughs> <laughs> Which group sang that song? You know, I can't remember. I'm I'm not a man into music these days. Yes. But uh, I remember. I you will remember it as well. I, I'm, that's what I'm know. trying to think about it. I, I'm trying to uh, figure out that was it the Rolling Stones, or was it Jim Reeves? I <laughs> I'm not too sure. You know. No. I, I, I'm not a big music yeah. fan. I know. How that do you do what you do? I do. <laughs> 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 that's a good one, Doctor McPhee. We are at the tail end of uh, the budget, budget making process. Of course, now Parliament is dealing with various issues. There was a news article yesterday that was quoting a report by the Auditor General, Nancy Gadongo, who says that the revenue raising proposals by the national government are unrealistic. Well, she's so right. What she's right. She's right? I, yeah, I, I worked beside Nancy once. <laughs> And my goodness, if there's one, well, many people have really impressed me, okay? You know, I was with a lady from South Africa yesterday, okay? And uh, she's in charge of caseware. It's uh, software that you use in accounting. And and then I have my, uh, you know, past student, Annie Waiveredo Mugumo, who works uh, at uh, Farmer's Choice. And, you know, this is... Uh, uh, there are a lot of people who impress me, okay? And mm -hmm. Stephanie Mwangi, who now is working in um, Bermuda, mm -hmm. at the beginning of next month, on the 1st of July next month, she's going to be promoted to become a manager in KPMG in, in Bermuda. So, um, but, you know, I, I'm impressed by a lot of people. But Nancy, I tell you, is one clever, hard-working person. And uh, we once worked together. This is when she was in charge of training in the office of the Auditor General. And my goodness, you know, she really impressed me. She's a, she's a woman whose word is worth its weight in gold. Now, I know you don't measure, you know, you, I know I can see you looking at me as if I were um, some bumba up, you know, but, uh, you know, these words don't measure, uh, they don't weigh at Dr. all. Terry, this is me listening to you keenly. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. You know, I, I thought you were saying, who are you? I, and I say my kid to go anyhow. No, but you know? <laughs> I will let you finish, then I'll come to that conclusion. But, but yes. no, the only thing is, I, I remember I was in um, some kind of um, a seminar, a meeting, a congress, I don't know what it was, but I mentioned, look, you know, the, the GDP grows, last year grew in Kenya by 5.6%, okay? Mm. And um, so now the GDP grows... If it grows by 5.6%, yeah. theoretically, there is 5.6% more money available. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the Kenya Revenue Authority is then given a target of 12% by government. Now, where do you get the extra money from? You know, if the economy has grown by 5.6%, okay, the amount of money has grown by 5.6%. So... If you now say we want 12% more, mm -hmm. you've got to start taxing a whole lot of things. And, you know, one of the things that we just don't realize in Kenya is we've got to live within our means. And, you know, that's, that's not only the government. It, it, mind you, it's principally the government because, mm. you know, I, I've always thought about this, this thing of leading by example. And, you know, when I think about that... You know, that, that saying, you will lead by example always, always. What do, what do I mean by that? The managing director of Nyaga Stockbrokers, this, we're going now back 18 years, okay? But mm. the managing director of Nyaga Stockbrokers, what he would do is he would come into the, um, the firm in the morning. He'd say, look, I've seen a cyber cafe down the road that I want to buy. There's a piece of land I want to buy. 
I know this from my past students. They're everywhere. They, and you see, you know, I, I, I've actually, I haven't told you, but I'm a CIA asset. Oh, I'm, I'm right. joking, actually. <laughs> that's the last thing I want to be on Earth, okay? Because, you know, I, I, that's a country I just don't believe in any longer. And, you know, I, I just don't understand how they got their wealth. But, but anyway, the situation here, okay, is he would come in. Now, how do they get that money? They would get that money by selling the shares of their clients. And that happened to a past student of mine. He, he was working at that time down, I think he's now working in Kabul in Afghanistan uh, for the World Organization of Credit uh, Unions. But anyway, in this case here, he was working for uh, Matiba down at Lolongo. So he had to drive into the nation, say, look, you sold my 1,000 shares in uh, East African breweries. I didn't tell you to do so. Why are you doing this? Now, they wanted the money. So, in, the, in fact, it was 2,000 shares. So, in this case here, there's, oh, sorry, sir, that was a, a computer error. We'll fix it. And they fixed it. Mm -hmm. It happened. That was February 2006. In September, it occurred again. And again, he had to drive from Lolongo. It wasn't so bad, the traffic in those days as it is now. But he had to come right into the central business district to, to actually right the, the situation. Now, the leader of uh, Nyaga stockbrokers stole between 800 million and 1 billion 300 million shillings of Kenyan's money. Now, what's, what, what's, what's the effect on the whole of the firm? A secretary owns a block of flats up at Dagoretti Corner. The, uh, the, the messenger was driving a car. So, you see, this happens, you know, you always will lead by example. So, mm. if you're a crook, everyone below Everybody you... Everybody below be you is a crook. And, you see, this, you know, I've said it before here, okay? You know, we've got to change the culture of Kenya. I give my master's students mm. some work to do in my class a week ago. And they use chat GPT. <laughs> so the situation, you know, we all we want is Ile Karatasi, as Joe McNeil used to say, Ile Karatasi need to a degree. Mm. Okay? So that's all we want. Hi. So, you know, people say, oh, you know, the university, you're going to learn so much there. And uh, I know Professor Ngumi at the University of Nairobi, and I know other people as well. You know, we are, we are joking half the time. So when Dr. Gathungu says that it's unrealistic She's to absolutely expect right. to raise this much, yeah. She's what, absolutely what's right. unrealistic about it? It's unrealistic because, you know, it's rather like, if you ask me, look, am I going to run in the marathon, okay, in the Olympics? I could say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it, but I'll, 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 I'll prove to you. I can't even run at the moment. You know, I used to play rugby. You get injured in rugby, you, you, you pay the price later. Mm. Okay? So the position is, it's unrealistic for me to say, look, suppose you challenge me. Look, McPhee, I challenge you. Walk back to Nairobi from here. Now, you know, is, it's unrealistic to give me that. Why? Because I can't do it. And you see, the uh, problem but is how, all... But how can CT tell that you can't do it? Well, you know, in this case here, mm. you know, he knows me and I know him. We know one another. OK. And he knows, look, this fellow McPhee, the way he came in this morning, he was limping a bit. You mm. know, so he, yeah, I can't do it. You know, by, yeah. by the time I get half there, mm. I'll actually be, you know, limping even worse. Mm. OK. Mm. It's just that my right knee, I had a rugby injury many years ago, 1971, in fact. But uh, I have to pay the price now. OK. So. It's unrealistic. Why? Because she knows the capacity of the economy to extract that income. Okay? Mm. Now, you see, one of the things that we've got to understand, <coughs> we, you know, we achieved something last year. In our, our, our exports last year were more than one trillion shillings for the first time ever. Mm. But you see, you've got to keep in mind, let's suppose my, my uh, exports are a million dollars. If the rate of exchange is 130 to the uh, to the uh, the dollar, yeah. that'll be 130 million shillings. If it's 160 to the dollar, my exports then will be 160 million. Mm -hmm. So you've got to remember that our, the, our exports went up from about <coughs> 849 billion 
to 1 trillion and 47 million. I've, I've got the numbers here, okay? Mm. Uh, one. But anyway, in this case here, you know, how much of that was purely due to the depreciation of the value of the Kenya shilling? Right. You see? So it was an actual volume increase. It, it, it was. Well, in some cases it was, okay? Mm. We produced. See, the problem is in Kenya, one of the big things that we suffer from, I don't know, it's, I, I use the word suffer. Possibly I use that badly, okay? But you know, Kenyans are incredibly good at imitating, okay? I once had a student actually, and um, she was wondering what what should I do as my research. And I was just driving home, and it was the days when Esther Pasaris had brought up the idea of adopt a light, yeah. okay? And um, so anyway, I told this young lady, and I think she's now working one of the big four firms, okay? But I told this lady, look, you know, why don't you do a study about how this adopt a light? came into being and so she studied it and she said well you know how it actually came into being is that Esther Pasaris had gone to Joburg she had seen you know uh, these advertisements on on uh, street lighting so she then brought the idea back and thanks to her actually we got a whole lot of street lighting which in fact just uh, on Saturday morning when I was driving to the university another light up in Lavington has been brought down by drunken drivers and those fellows are really successful they they in Ooh, fact the drivers or the, the drivers <laughs> okay. they know how to go we after to the lights them down. What, what they, they know how to exactly <laughs> you hit the nail on the head there and do once again okay but anyway in this situation you know um, Kenya uh, Nairobi had actually been immersed in darkness and then <clears throat> Esther Pasaris was responsible for bringing lights back okay now, what happened? Well, first of all, this lady, she did a long study and then said, OK, well, you know, in this case here, when you're thinking about innovation, innovation, you can, it can also be imitation. Mm. The Chinese are very, very good at this. But mind you, now they are, they're, you know, their innovation is incredible. You know, the things that they're doing now. With, but anyway, the situation here is she wrote this thesis and then she said, well, this actually was innovation. And I can't remember her name, this young lady. But I said, now, look, you know, Esther Pasaris got this idea in, in, in Joburg. How is it not imitation? How is it innovation? And anyway, I think she had to change the thing and then ca came to the conclusion. Now, this is imitation, not, uh, not innovation. OK, because any innovation... It's a very, very important thing. And, you know, many, many Kenyans are, are I innovating. You know, when you look at the IT industry, the startups in IT in Nairobi and, and, and in Kenya, mm. it's phenomenal, the number. You know, it's just phenomenal. So this but, people, Dr. McAfee, just back to the issue. If, indeed, the Auditor General can just look casually and see, well, looking at the performance of the economy in the last year, how much you're able to raise in revenues the last year, how much our economy grew this year, there's absolutely no way you can then have this new revenue target. Correct. She cannot be the only one who's seeing this. I know. So but how do you explain it? How do you explain the people at the National Treasury, the people in planning, the people in the President's Economic Advisory Council, who would look at this and say, yeah, we can raise 2.7 trillion shillings next year? Well, you see, one of the problems really here is that um, in, in the budget, the budget making process is, you know, you are in fact looking at expenses. And OK, well, you know, in this case here, you can see, well, we've got so much more in spending on salaries, etc., etc., etc. Now, the problem is, to my mind, that is the wrong way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And I was in a meeting recently, okay, with some people, okay, in a company, and they said, okay, we're going to grow by 30%. I said, look, you know, you guys are being unrealistic. You know, what you've got to do is you've got to cut your spending. Now, Kenyans don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. You know, it's, it's a national problem. In every company that I'm a, a director almost, you have people over-budgeting. They're over-optimistic. You know, and I remember once, you know, the World Bank wanted to value our old railway system. 
and you could see that the use of the railway was coming down, 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 down. And anyway, we went in there, and um, the chief financial officer, a past student of mine, in fact, he, he said, OK, from this year on, it's going to go up, 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 up. I said, look, <laughs> on what basis do you make that assumption? You know, history tells you this this thing is going down. OK, it's it's rather like poster. Mm. OK, fewer and fewer people are sending letters, mm. you know. So the position here, OK, is, you know, I could not persuade him that this was not going to go up. And why was why was it going to go up? Because if it is going up, the value of the railway to the World Bank is going to be higher. Mm. So, but, you know, we, this is where we've got to be real. And, and to my mind, you know, I, I was taken out for lunch a month ago, okay, because I don't like going to restaurants, okay, because uh, you see, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practicing Kikuyu, actually. <laughs> so I've got, <laughs> I've got a friend of mine who actually used that phrase once, you see, and, you know, practicing Kikuyu is a guy who doesn't like spending money. But I'm a Scotsman, and, and, and practicing Scotsmen are rather like practicing Kikuyu. But, but anyway, so I, I was taken out to lunch. They had their son from London, okay, he's a high flyer and so on. So we, we were there, okay. And as we came out, um, there was this young lady, uh, and she was eating crisps or something, but driving out slowly in a Porsche Cayenne. And um, a week ago, actually, at the World Bank meeting, I was uh, with um, a, a lecturer, a fellow lecturer, who's now working, actually, as an economist, a very, very clever economist in the, work in the Central Bank of Kenya. And he says, you know, I still drive a small car even though he's now working in the central bank because those people are wakubwa, you know, okay? So he says, you know, I, I parked beside, a, you know, a V8 on my left and another, you know, Prado on my right and, you know, I, I almost got to slink out of the car because they think, who you need nanny? This man, you know, in fact, a friend of mine was going to actually drive in a Vitz in the motorcade to the swearing-in of, of pre our President Ruta. The President told me, he said, look, the police will stop you. I'll give you a chauffeur-driven car, you see. And that's... I, a friend of mine used to drive a smaller car. He's now got a Prada. So when he comes up the Mombasa Road, the police never stop him because, who you name Kubolana, you know? So this the, the position here, okay, is we all of us have got to live within our means. Mm. I saw this KN. I thought, okay, what's the price of a KN in Nairobi? Well, if you get a 2020 model, okay, it's there. You can you just Google it immediately now. 14.2 million shillings. Now, this young lady, I, this looked a brand new car, was glistening, okay, and did she spend 14 million shillings on that? And, you know, one of our main imports last year was machinery, but machinery is, is cars. Mm. And, you know, in Nairobi, if you turn up at a board meeting in, in let's say, a Vitz, you won't be a member of that board the next day because you, you uh, well, who Pretty. are you you know this is uh, this is uh, it's a serious uh, company uh, yes i was asking mm. the question to dr mcfee he mentioned that the world bank was interested in understanding the value of the railway line mm. uh, I, I want to understand that interest why well, to tell you the truth, I don't know, because, in fact, the only thing I advised this young man, I was with a, another consultant, actually, and I advised this young man, look, you know, this thing here is not valuable any longer. And, you know, if you actually look at the, the real situation, um, is that it has not developed, uh, you know, at all. But I think, you see, also, it could be viewed as an alternative to the SGR. And, uh, you know... Um, Thankfully, for example, all of these floods, they haven't affected the SGR. They've actually affected our old railway line, if you remember, up in, Kajiado, uh, up in Kijabe. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think, you know, maybe what they, someone had approached the World Bank and said, look, you know, why don't you give us a loan? We can upgrade the, uh, the locomotives on the, on the, uh, the old railway line. And if, if they're going to uh, uh, travel at a slower pace, they, they won't be derailed, etc. So 
I, I don't know. I don't know why the World Bank, you know, but I'm always a little bit, like you, I'm a little bit suspicious always when the World Bank becomes interested in something because, <laughs> you know, you think now, which uh, Bonham Cuba is going to come and stay in the imperial suite, you know, in one of our hotels in Nairobi and uh, say this is part of the loan, you see. So, but anyway, it's, it's uh, um, but I don't know, to tell you the truth. But back to the discussion about uh, the finance bill. You see, the, when you look at the infrastructure that we have in this country, that's where our railway is part, well, our railway is part of the infrastructure. It's supposed to be one of the forces that actually drives the development of an economy. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, are we saying that the discussions around this particular current bill and the taxes that are being mentioned, that some of these taxes may afford some of the very factors of production that we have, and in so doing, it may have the complete opposite of what it is that any government policy is supposed to do to jumpstart the economy, to inject some momentum into it, and to move it forward. Well, you see, one of the problems, really, that we have in Kenya, you know, a lot of, um, some of my friends actually sp speak about the Africa Free Trade Agreement, okay, and, you know, again, unfortunately, there are so many people in the world, and it happens not only here in Kenya, but I, I find it especially here in Kenya, but uh, people all over the world, actually, I, I spend quite a lot of my, uh, time listening to a fellow called Stephen Gardner, I think his name is, okay? And you realize he's, he's an American guy who speaks, and you, you realize that he, will, he has a slant, okay? He has a slant, and the, the unfortunate thing is that when something objective occurs which is not in his line of thinking, he will not give that item any, any prominent what's, prominence whatsoever. And you see... What, what is our problem in Kenya? Our problem is, and this is, you know, a very unfortunate thing, our costs of production in Kenya are very high. Now, what's the problem? If you look at projections, the projected GDP of Tanzania is quite above that, in the, uh, that of Kenya in the year 2050. So, now, what we've got to do as a country is to realize, look, we've got to become more competitive. A number of years ago, a number of people in the NCPB, the National Cereals and Produce Board, set companies up and imported, uh, you know, Uganda had a bumper maize crop. They imported maize from Uganda. Now, you buy maize at 900 shillings a bag in Uganda. Here in Kenya... Uh, a farmer will uh, demand, he, well, they're demanding at the moment 4,000 shillings, okay, they're getting actually 3,000. But the situation is the cost of production is so much higher in Kenya than it is in Uganda. Now, if we talk about a free trade agreement for the whole of Africa, what's going to happen? You know, <clears throat> I have a past student, Isaac and Juguna, okay, and he's actually in the egg business. Now, you, you can actually bring a, 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 a crate of eggs from Uganda and sell it anywhere in Kenya cheaper than production costs in Kenya. So this is why the, the, the people in the egg business say, look, we've got to stop these imports from Uganda. He himself buys all of his raw material from Uganda, except for lime from Koru. Everything else... Maize, sunflower seeds, etc., etc., etc. All of it is bought in Uganda. I'm in the coffee business, okay? Four coffee uh, factories in Western have closed down. The farmers will actually get more for their raw coffee in Uganda than in Kenya. And yet, when they go and buy their petrol, when they buy their Tusca, well, you've got to get the Uganda equivalent, when you buy your sugar, when you buy your unga, when you buy... All of those things are cheaper. And, you know, so th the point here is we've got to think about how we can become more, e more efficient, more, e uh, more competitive. A, a number of years ago, the largest foreign direct investment in Uganda mm. 
came from Kenya. F the, f the latest figures that I have, okay, I, because you can't get these, these numbers immediately, but we were the fourth largest foreign direct investor in Uganda in 2022. Mm -hmm. And the amount we invested, $7.5 billion, okay, was in fact <clears throat> more than 20% of the total foreign uh, direct investment by other countries in Kenya. In Now, what course, sectors are you investing? Well, uh, in manufacturing. You see, this is why if you take, if we go back to uh, 2019, in 2019, manufacturing made up 8.4% of our GDP. At one stage, it was, you know, up, up towards 15%. The only problem is that was a time when China was really, really very, very they could produce at a very low cost, okay? Yep, yep. And the result was that, um, well, you know, Firestone here went out of business. Um, the batteries up in, in Nakuru went out of business, mm -hmm. okay, ever ready. And, you know, and, and many, I, I have a past student actually who used to manufacture kitchenware. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he just could not compete with, uh, with items imported from China. So he had to send his work workforce home and he then now buys a kitchenware in uh, t uh, China and then imports it. So he's just become a trader right. instead of a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So manufacturing now takes 7.2 percent. It's 7.2 percent of GDP. It's down from 8.4, mm -hmm. but it's dropped from 14. Mm -hmm. Now... As Professor Wainaina was mentioning here actually a week ago, when you look at Vietnam, Vietnam is in fact more and more and more, and they're, they're above eight, 15% uh, of their GDP is, is from manufacturing. Mm. And uh, Professor Wainaina was mentioning, you know, Samsung, which is, is a South Korean company, they've moved out of China because... The big problem about China now is that they have got such incredible surpluses, you know, with many, many countries around the world. And they they used to put all that surplus into um, U.S. dollars. But now they realize, now, wait a moment, you know, these Americans, they can start stealing your money. So what are they doing? <clears throat> they're, they're actually getting out of dollars. okay, getting out of U.S. treasuries and actually buying gold. But anyway, the thing is that a lot of resistance is coming up against China. So Samsung actually moved their manufacturing plant from, uh, from China to Vietnam. And, you know, the Vietnamese government made it really easy, really easy to invest in that particular country. So, mm. you know, mind you, they, they've got, they generate 94,000 megawatts of electricity. Our generation is capable of 3,000, mm. but we're using about 2,200. Okay? So, Doc, are you saying it's really easy now, essentially, to hand over what I want to call the responsibility of the economy for Kenya very easily to other countries because of a very difficult tax regime, essentially? Well, yeah, this is, this is what happens. You see, <clears throat> you know, you take the normal rate of tax in the uk the rate of corporate tax okay is well it's dropped okay it's now, it's now about 18% okay mm. but you see <clears throat> apple amazon uh, microsoft all of these companies have their headquarters in dublin ireland And, you know, Ireland, its economy is one of the, the fastest growing in the European Union, okay? Germany is actually in, in recession. They're going down because, um, well, the price they have to pay for the gas that they're now forced to buy from the United States is six times what it used to be from Russia. The, the, the pipeline was blown up, okay, by the, the, let's face it, by the Americans, okay. And so the situation now is that, you know, many German companies are actually now saying, how do we, how do we solve this problem? Mm. Uh, Volkswagen has a big plant in China, but the Americans have told the Germans now, look, you close that thing down. They, there's also uh, a big uh, pharmaceutical company in, in Germany, which operates in China. And again, the Americans have said, you close that thing down. You, you've got to stop trading. But the Americans themselves trade, okay? They, they, they are, uh, the amount they buy from China is about $380 billion a year. But anyway, so the situation here is, you're absolutely right. 
You see, what we're doing is we're taxing ourselves out of existence. Mm. And you see, I don't have children, so I, you know, when I die in maybe even Le- Keshu or Keshu Kutwa, but you know, the thing is, you just put me up in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Langata Road, okay, a little bit to the right there. You know, I was, I was asked recently, he said, look, you know, hey, just tell us who you are, what you're doing, and where you're going to be in 10 years' time. And, <laughs> and so, you know, so and they, are, they pointed at me first and they said, hey, we're going to begin with you. Mm. So I said, well, hey, you know, my name is Jim McPhee. I teach, uh, you know, at Strathmore University. It's along Langata Road. And I think in 10 years' time, I'm going to be a little bit further up Langata Road, <laughs> opposite the, the Nairobi game park. You know, that's where the cemetery is. So, but anyway, you see, we, we've got to think about the future of Kenya. You know, I, I was actually, I, I was going to tell you about the history of Haiti. You know, we the, the Americans will call it Haiti or whatever, you know, but I call it Haiti because the original inhabitants <coughs> of that island, <coughs> that island actually, Christopher Columbus landed on that island, okay, Santo Domingo is called, uh, in the year 1492. Now, the Portuguese had not even got to Cape Town by then, you know, the Cape of Good Hope. But anyway, then what happened is the, it became a colony of uh, Spain, and then the French took over the western part. And um, it was one of those very, very sad things, okay, because, uh, you know, they, they were uh, dealing with slaves. But now, Haiti became in- independent in 1804, Less than 28 years after the United States, okay, that was, you know, July the 4th, 1776. Mm. So less than 28 years afterwards, on the 1st of January 2000, uh, sorry, not 2000, 18, uh, 1804, Haiti became independent. But you see, it's a country, amazingly, that I used to follow very, very much because they had a dictator there. His name was Papa Doc Duvalier. Yes. You know him well. Yes. Okay. A, a very violent man. A, a violent man, okay, mm. yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, he used to kill people and so on. And so did his son. Yeah, and his, his son then took over from him. And the wife of the son probably could outdo anyone in Kenyan stealing, you know. <laughs> this lady just, <laughs> you know, she stole... <laughs> You know, and the the thing is, the son was a completely immature man. He used to buy, ride these picky pickies around state house, you know, at high speed, and you know, and and this was his enjoyment. But there was a coup, and you know, now that country is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Now, in the late 1700s, it produced the major part of the coffee and the sugar that was uh, was consumed in Europe. And if you remember, you know, we were once known as a coffee-producing country. Mm-hmm. When you actually look at our numbers for coffee, okay, uh, the production, well, one of the figures in the economic survey is we, we produced 52,000 tonnes in 2022, and then it went down to 49,000 tonnes in 2023. Another number in the, uh, the economic survey is that we marketed 42,000 tonnes in 2022, uh, 32,000 tons in 2023. So <clears throat> it's down. But we used to be, you know, we were known as a coffee producing country. Mm. And I then think and say, well, why are we f- making this relationship with Haiti? And, you know, the, the original inhabitants used to call the mount uh, the, the, the island Haiti. Mm-hmm. That's why I call it Haiti. But of course, the Americans will say Asia. I don't know. I, I, I may. Maybe the Americans are just interested in trying to absor- absolve the name of the Clinton Foundation because they had raised a lot of money for a Haiti and, you know, it didn't go to the right place. Let me just mention that because, you know, I, I, you have to remember um, one, of, one of these guys who was talking on, uh, you know, one of these uh, 
podcast in the US. He said, look, I, I just want to make it clear. He was talking about Hillary Clinton, okay? He said, look, I just want to make it clear. I'm not going to commit suicide, okay? But, you know, many Epstein committed suicide, <laughs> etc. But we're getting into hot water here. I can look at you. This man is looking at me and saying, who are you? This man is Mjinga Kabisa, you know? But, Paul uh, Ibala, I'm sorry I say these things, okay? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but sorry, you know, I, I got off the track there a little bit. But, you know, let me tell you a story about Jerrica. Mm. You know, there was an American lecturer in, I don't know, one of the universities here. And he was one of these preachers, you know. And one of the students turned up and he says, now, why are you, why are you turning up? You know, you, you're late for class. He said, well, you know, I have to come from Jericho. Wow, you come from Jericho. He thought it was Jericho in, 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 in Israel. Israel. So he said, oh, come in, come in, come in, come in. You know? <laughs> he thought he'd flown in from, from Jericho. But that's, that, that's my little story about Jericho. It's Jericho the about, Estes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you were to sit down with President Ruto today and ahead of um, the budget reading on Thursday, what's the one thing that you'd tell him in a minute? In a minute, what I tell him is, look, Many poor people live in Kenya. You know, we can't have people in government and even in business, actually. If I pay myself 230 million shillings, what am I going to do with that money? Chris Kirubi is dead. We've got to ask ourselves, where is his soul now, you know? Mm -hmm. But the thing here, okay, is let's suppose that I decide I'm going to sleep on gold sheets. Will I be more comfortable than I would be with cotton sheets? The answer is no. You know, I wouldn't even be able to turn over, mm. you know, without even, you know. So we have to cut back on government expenditure. You know, 1.1 billion shillings is going to be used to upgrade um, the deputy president's house. Now, in Strathmore University... We built the business school, the student center, and the management science building, those three buildings, for 700 million shillings. For 700 million shillings. Mm -hmm. Three buildings. Three buildings. And, you know, I'd invite you sometime, you know, you can come and have lunch there with mm -hmm. me, okay, and see what kind of buildings they are. And now, this, and this you know, one building in Karen one, is going to cost us. 1.1 billion being okay. spent on the deputy president's house. You know, we, we have to become realistic. We have, you know, we've got to lead by example. Judge people from what they do, not by, by what they say. And I realize I'm standing at the front of a class, okay? I can be the biggest hypocrite on earth. Because if I'm demanding my students to do work, and unfortunately, they find it difficult, okay? But I also, if I don't do my work, I am a hypocrite. And, you know, we got a lot of... Well, I was talking to a managing director of a company on Friday, and he said, well, you know, that's a definition of a politician. But, you know, we got to change. We have to change. We have to do If better. we don't change, the economy of the world is going to change Kenya, and we're going to end up like Haiti. Dr. Jim McPhee, thank you very much for joining us. Dr. McPhee is a senior lecturer at the Strathmore University Business School. Thank you for tuning in. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.